Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, we are excited to welcome our panelists. My name is Nara Milanish. I direct the Center for Mexico and Central America, CEMECA, um, at Columbia University. And one of the projects that uh, the center oversees is, is um, helping to support a series of what we call applied academic projects. Um, that seek, seek to bring area studies knowledge um, and expertise out into the world and to communicate uh, between campus academies and, on the one hand and journalists, lawyers, and the rest, activists, advocates, and the world in general on the other. So this uh, project that you're going to hear about today is one of those projects, and I'm super excited to hear um, from the journalists who have organized it. Um, and I will now put myself on mute and pass the rectangle to uh, Danielle. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Nara. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, thank you for joining us. So I just wanted to give a quick uh, welcome. Um, we are going to present today about the Honduran narco state and the US federal courts that are prosecuting some of the high level elements of that illicit network and the documentation that's come from that process, which we believe is highly valuable to a lot of people. Um, my name is Danielle Mackey. I am an independent journalist, and I've covered Central America for more than a decade. And uh, often I've done that in conjunction with my colleague here today, Jennifer Avila. Um, we are going to present this project that we've been working on, thanks to the support of the Center for Mexico and Central America at Colombia and, and NADA. And um, we're joined today by two beloved colleagues and friends, Amelia and Pamela, who will introduce themselves in just a second uh, as well. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer to introduce herself and to also tell a little bit about Contra Corriente, the outlet. Hi, uh, thank you for, for being here. I'm Jennifer Avila. I'm a journalist in Honduras. I founded Contra Corriente in 2017. And since then we have been doing in-depth investigations in different investigation lines as corruption, human rights, uh, sexual and reproductive rights, violence, and migration and uh, extractive industries and corruption and impacts in the, in the environment and in social uh, conflicts. And uh, well, trying to understand Honduras <laughs> in different angles uh, through journalism and also at the same time trying to empower uh, the citizenship, uh, the citizens to know more about the country and democracy in general. So that's, um, that's my work. <laughs> and you can follow contracorriente.red to know more. <laughs> Thank, thank you for coming. Amelia and Pamela, could you introduce yourselves quickly? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Amelia Frank Vitale. I'm an anthropologist. I'm currently a postdoc and a lecturer at Princeton University in the program in Latin American Studies. And I have been focused on Central American transit migration for many years, since 2010. Um, and the last about five years, I've been focused really specifically on Honduras um, and what happens with young people when they are deported back to Honduras. And as a sort of extension of that work, understanding the the socio-political context of everything that that shapes the sort of sense of possibility and uh, survival that young people have in Honduras has, has sort of come into uh, become something that I've had to study and wanted to understand. Um, the work of Contra Corriente has been really helpful in that. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm very excited about this project for because uh, in order to understand the sort of anthropological questions that I have, um, having this kind of data has is potentially really exciting. Um, so I'll turn it over to Pam. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Pamela Ruiz. I have a PhD in criminal justice from John Jay College, and my area of research includes violence, extortion, and drug trafficking in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. 
I am currently in the private sector. However, for the purpose of today's meeting, um, much of my comments will come from my academic work. I look forward to seeing, I'm really excited to seeing what you guys have found, um, you know, and just your project in general and the discussion that follows. So thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, I am going to share my screen really quickly. We'll see if this works and uh, go through. Hold on one second here. I can do it if you want. Do you wanna do it, Jen? <laughs> sure, Dali. <Okay. laughs> let me see, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, thanks so much, Jen. Um, okay, so um, the project that we are about to present is still in relatively early stages. And at this phase, we're calling it Corruption on Trial, Investigating the Honduran Narco State Through the US Federal Courts. And we'll tell you a bit about our plan and what we've done and what remains to be done and the certain the things we've tried and uh, where we'd like to end up eventually. Um, and then what we'd like to invite Pamela and Amelia to speak about is how, first of all, they've experienced the impact of these federal trials of the Honduran narco state in their um, spheres. And then also to talk about how having easier access to the documentation that's been produced by these trials would be useful for them in anthropology and in criminology and in their wider research work. Um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks, Jen. Nice um, Okay, so let's start with the trials themselves. Um, in the past decade, U.S. federal courts, and it's principally the one here in the Southern District of New York in, in Manhattan, I'm speaking to you from New York City right now, uh, have gone after the scaffolding of the cocaine trade in Honduras. And it turns out that that scaffolding is made up largely of high-level political and corporate leadership and members of law enforcement and the military. And the court's prosecutions include testimony and evidence that uh, are produced by, among other things, investigations by US federal agencies like the DEA and ICE, um, along with uh, testimony from cartel leaders themselves. So what we're seeing is the US government throwing a significant part of its weight behind the aim of deconstructing a corrupt foreign network that basically has run Honduras. And that makes what the Southern District and the other courts that are involved in this uh, doing quite novel, because it's hard to think of another example of US federal courts essentially hauling in a generation of political and state security leaders um, in the way that they're doing in, in Honduras. And so to give you an example of how high level this goes, the upcoming trial in the spring of next year is of the man who was until recently the president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez. Um, the courts established that they have jurisdiction to do this um, because the final destination for the cocaine that's being moved is the United States and to consumers in the United States. And that takes us to the role of the United States, in fact, um, in this entire story beyond just the Southern District's trials. Um, one of the early hunter and drug traffickers was Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros, who was moving cocaine in the 70s and 80s while he was contracted by the United States government uh, to ferry military supplies to the Contras in Nicaragua. Um, Mata Ballesteros was key in connecting the Colombian cartels with the Mexican cartels. And now those cartel networks are strong and violent and multi-billion dollar businesses that ferry drugs mostly to consumers in the United States. Um, their violence, as we've seen, pushes many Hondurans to flee uh, and they flee oftentimes towards the United States. Uh, and the money of the drug trade has made it a locus of corruption, and that has ended up rotting away democracy, 
because uh, political leaders and police and military officials start working on behalf of the drug trade and not on behalf of Honduran citizens. Um, Private enterprise has served as money laundering, uh, offered money laundering services essentially and served as bankers for cartels. And um, these elites, the political elite, the corporate elite, the state security elite uh, are of course the traditional allies of the United States government um, historically. And they've been bolstered through trade policies from the United States, they've been bolstered through foreign investment and um, the US has militarized drug war. Um, so in the face of all of that, what you're seeing from the Southern District is striking and in some ways uh, a countercurrent. Um, you can go to the perfect. Thank you, Jen. Um, okay, so our project specifically, um, what we're looking at is the documents that are produced by each of these trials. So every one of these more than a dozen trials in the past decade have produced thousands of pages of documents. And these documents include testimony and evidence of how the drug trade took over the state, took over the Honduran state. And we believe that that information is useful to a great many people interdisciplinarily, not just journalists like Jen and I, although also other journalists, but you know everybody from academics um, to even average Hondurans and, and, and average citizens. Um, we uh, know that these documents are all public, um, but the problem is that they uh, you have to buy them, you have to purchase them. And they exist on a federal database called PACER, which is not the most user-friendly website in the world. And so that makes their that makes access to them relatively prohibitive, especially for, among other people, Hondurans. Um, they're all also in English. And so we believe that those are all compelling reasons to make these documents um, more accessible to a wider swath of people. And so our projects aim is to build a database of those documents um, that would be searchable and bilingual and to offer additional machine learning based analytical tools. Um, that database will live at Contra Corriente at the outlet that Jennifer's, where Jennifer is editor in chief. Um, and what we've done uh, in the very beginning, the genesis of the project was that in 2021, we received a grant from the Fund for Investigative Journalism to buy about 60% of the documents. And um, then we had assistance from Jennifer's team at Contra Corriente. We had a US graduate student in geography and a French journalist who all gave us invaluable support in helping to order these documents to, to make sense of them and to start to upload them to a server. Um, and then we, with the support of um, the Center for Mexico and Central America at Colombia in the past year, uh, were able to hire a PhD student at Colombia who studies organized crime to continue to help um, analyzing the documents and a data design firm in Mexico uh, to begin assembling a pilot uh, version of the database. And um, we, at the end, when before we all before we break, we will share an Excel sign up sheet for if you are interested in uh, potentially getting involved or if you think you might have skills that would be uh, useful. And so, um, before that, though, um, Jen is going to talk a bit about more of the mechanics of what we've done so far. Sorry. Well, I am. Um, well, I think Danielle, she told about the importance of, of this project. And as she said, we are just like starting with how like a whole world of ideas of what doing with this, but it has a lot of challenges. Um, because uh, of course this, these are uh, court documents. So language is not like the most simple language. Well, Pam, she's a lawyer and she works with, with laws and everything, but for the rest of the world, <laughs> this language is, is um, sometimes it's hard to understand also. Um, in Honduras, for example, as, as a journalist, I have um, 
I know that the justice system um, of court documents is really poor here in Honduras. We, we ask for documents for trials in, in the justice system and they give us like this, <laughs> this uh, uh, quantity of, of documents in paper. So there's, they're public, but they're not accessible. In PACER you have documents that are public, but that are not accessible because they have a cost. And so we wanted the, we we want the to 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 get free the, all these these documents, but also why 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 do we want that? It, that's because we need to uh, read the documents, to analyze the documents, especially to identify not only uh, crimes committed uh, by people, you know, not only like people and crimes. I think these documents also tell a lot of stories and also can make us identify pat patterns for the crimes, but also for not only like narco crimes, but also patterns of um, of how power of how of how political and economic power is used in Honduras. Um, also, we we can identify other related crimes. For example, in 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 some cases, in in I think in, in more of the cases in which police uh, is involved or politicians are involved, we all, we also have corruption crimes that they are not going to be prosecuted in the U.S. But I think um, Durham population and Durham citizens need to know that this is not only about narco. This is also about corruption. This is also about abuse of power in the communities. This is also about how pol politics and how these have been um, damaging and destroying not only democracy, but also the social fabric of our society. So I think it's, we have a lot of uh, stories and we have a lot of proofs also on those documents, on those, on, those, on those cases that tells us more about corruption and more about uh, different or, or, or other related crimes. Also, uh, you can identify victims there. Not only, we, we have been only focusing on uh, these corrupt politicians that they are now in jail, but what was the consequence of narco state? What was the consequence um, in Honduras that the police that need that are made to protect us, they were working with narcos? What are the consequences for the communities? And I think in the in the cases you can see a lot of details that can bring us to investigate more and to research more in Honduras about uh, victims or identifying different kind of victims of all these structures. Uh, well, so we, we say this is like the basics and we're very basic in, in this thing because we're journalists, we're, we're we're not, we're used to read a lot of documents, but then when our, this is digital, how to put it or what, what people will need to read in a document. So we started downloading the, the documents as Daniel said, then extract the text from the PDFs because these are, these are portable documents. So um, we think that extracting the text from the PDFs is also useful to copy um, parts or to search words that we need to know or that we are in more interested in. So it makes the, the, the text more uh, readable, maybe, or more searchable in a way. And also we uh, said, we, we, we also thought that it, they are needed to be translated to into Spanish because, uh, well, in Honduras, a lot of people is interested, not only like everybody, but also academic and journalists that that they don't speak Spanish, English and they will know, will will use these documents and would use it better if they're in Spanish. 
And let, well, we we thought also about looking for analyzing categories inside the documents and some words and some things that we need to search a special concepts about narco state and about co-conspiracy and about different kind of concepts that you can search on the documents and then also analyze. And in this kind in this part of analyzing, we were we spoke a lot with Amelia, which is here and she will uh, tell more. But at the first um, when we had the first idea with Daniel, we told her about this and we said, well, I think we need to work together, journalists and anthropologists and lawyers and different kind of professionals to understand better and to have like a deep, um, um, like a deep concept of what is happening in this in these cases. And I know that we have different kind of analyzing systems and analyzing dynamics. But when we put all these analyzing dynamics together with different disciplines of, of social sciences and journalism, I think we can uh, have a better view of the, of the whole problem. So um, we worked with journalists, we worked with tech experts, we worked with researchers, to know what to do with all these documents because when we had them and we ordered them, we say, well, now what? How can we do this of extracting the text and then translating? Which are the tools that are better to, to buy the license or to put into this, into this process? Uh, we had a lot of ideas of how to visualize it we haven't gone in that way right now. We, we, we haven't published yet a website or, um, or a place where you can see this right now because we are just trying to, to put this in a easier way to search and to use. We also thought at first, and I think that's a big challenge right now, now we have the documents. We had these journalists making the database and the directory of how this or of what are you going to find in this in every document and it, that's a very huge job that a lot of journalists and volunteers did with the documents that we downloaded also the text ex ex experts that finding the the tools and finding what was the best way to extract the text and to and to translate it and um, um but the challenge now is what is coming next when we when you can download the text, when you can extract the text and you can translate it, what is like the, the value that we are going to give to the people, not only to free the documents or to so people can download it, what are they going to search in, in, in there and what kind of analysis you can have our first analysis or for a first view of the analysis that we have made about the documents, but also how you can connect it with other databases. We as journalists, we know a lot of databases that journalists have, have been doing in around the world. For example, OCCRPs, they have this great uh, website or or this way this great place where they can mix databases so you can have more information about cases crimes uh, person people uh, companies etc um, and that could be really great you know that we can have a database with names go conspiracies uh, companies, uh, people involved, politicians, institutions that you can connect with other databases that are public. So that's like the dream, and that's a big, a really big challenge because in the um, in the trial documents, you you read a lot of legal statements, also a lot of stories, a lot of um, uh, different kind of of information that is not easy to to order or to tabulate you know they are not numbers they're like a lot of words 
Pa, pa will, pa is like, yes, 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 because she's the lawyer. <laughs> but, so now we, I can show you what we did with this case in a specific, because this case, we analyze it more and we made profiles of the, of the people that we were interested in. This was the case, United States versus Lobo, which is one of the sons of the ex-president uh, Porfirio Lobo Sosa. But in this case, the thing is that the focus war was on Lobo, on Lobo's son, on Fabio Lobo. But this case had a lot of information about police, police involving in, in drug trafficking. So Daniela and I thought, well, maybe it's better to tell the story about how national police gets involved in, in, in narcos, in narco trafficking, and explain it more, and then put uh, this our journalistic view of how is now the national police in Honduras after all these trials. So, well, this is how you can you could see it. Like this is the original document, and this is the extract text, and this is the translated text of the of the document so that's that's what we're doing so this is more the what are you what we have been downloading and um, analyzing too there's like information also extracted um, of what are you going to find in every document um, we have it for, by cases what kind of document you have, the number of the document, and uh, what are you going to find in there? Here is Lobo, for example. So with Lobo, we did this, well, with the documents, what are you going to find in documents that you can also read, uh, extracted and translated. But then what are the meanings of this, um, these uh, cooperating witnesses, for example, some of here in Andres, a lot of people were, were very confused of who was CW2 or CW3 or what, what does, that, that just means. And um, that helped a, a lot, uh, helped us a lot to understand uh, the role of each people mentioned in these cases. So um, this is more or less what we have been working. And then we published this, this article about, how, uh, about the police, the national police, just only analyzing the case United States versus Lobo. Um, and that's like the first exercise we did of, to, to, to understand or to prove that maybe journalists could use this so if we if we needed to uh, to use this to to make our article, I think a lot of journalists and academics and lawyers could could use could could find useful this tool, and um, we're just helping to to yes to facilitate this process. So that's the end of the presentation. Let me see. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for my English, <laughs> but I don't have so much practice here. <laughs> Jen, your English is perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Pamela and Amelia, I don't know which of you would like to speak first, but we would love to hear from you all. First of all, anything you want to say, of course, but uh, also uh, the two things that I introduced at the very beginning, if you wouldn't mind, uh, one being if you could talk a bit about the impact of these trials in your spheres in, in criminology and in anthropology. Um, and I know you all do additional work outside of those two. So perhaps there's other things you, you want to say, but, and then the other thing would be um, what sorts of, why it would be useful to have perhaps easier access to these documents um, and what sorts of things you could envision using them for if, if you have those sorts of ideas. And again, anything else you'd like to add? So thank you. Um. Pam, if you want to go first, I'm happy to see to you, but I can just dive in. Okay. Um, so I guess to the first question, um, I think the high profile trials, especially with um, the brother of the former Honduran president with Tony Hernandez, which 
I know you two are very well aware of, but so the brother of, of the now extradited president was first on trial and convicted. And now obviously Juan Orlando is also on trial or will be. Um, I think that in my field, the people that I work with, the communities that I'm in, it confirmed what people already felt to be true. Um, I think the involvement of high level politicians, not exclusively, but particularly in the, the national party that uh, Juan Orlando headed um, was a secreto a voces, right? A sort of open secret that in the world, the, the so I worked in the communities around San Pedro Sula, um, pretty poor urban margins um, primarily. And there, I think the sense was, well, we know they're all narcos. We know this. Why doesn't anybody do anything? Why doesn't why doesn't anybody care? Um, and I think the intervention of the United States was greeted with um, relief and and joy by um, the people that the, the communities that I was working with. So it, I think it like validated um, what people already felt. That said, I think there's also a real um like disappointment that not much has changed that these individuals have been taken out of Honduras and are going to be on trial or have been on trial but that that doesn't translate to a change in the way that people feel their daily lives are are led um or what kind of um security state they they have how they feel they can trust authorities i i think there was more hope that it would really, really changed some things fundamentally. And I think we can see the limits of what U.S. extradition and U.S. trials really can do um, transnationally like that. Um, I think, yeah, people would, were hopeful that it would, it would have ripple effects of greater change. And I don't think that that's, that's borne out. Um, in terms of the, the sort of usefulness of this kind of database, I think there's a couple of realms. One is particularly as an anthropologist who is focused on migration, I come to Honduras with a whole lot of really detailed understanding of migration. That is not the same as a really detailed understanding of corruption networks and political maneuvers and parties and, and police forces. And I feel like to be able to talk and study in a nuanced and competent way migration, I then also have to understand all of these other things. And that is very, very complex. I mean, I'm sure it's complex in every country. In Honduras, it's a quagmire. And having um, the reporting that outlets like Contra Corriente can do, but also the data in a way that is accessible and manageable, that then both allows reporting to happen, but also that I could access is really helpful in being able to get the the foundation understood in order to then be able to analyze the very specific niche that, that my work um, covers. I'd say the other thing, well, there's academically and in sort of my own work is the ability to analyze the kind of meta discourse around what emerges in the trial. So for me, less about being able to say this particular person who had this particular position was found to be guilty of this particular thing, but to look at the things in aggregate, to look at the patterns that emerge about how people talk about how they became involved in drug trafficking, about how people talk about what networks were involved. Um, in the, the trial of Tony Hernandez, I was really fascinated by the way that um, Maradiaga, Davis Leonel Mar Maradiaga, one of the, the cachiros, the way that he spoke about his relationship to power, um, for me in the sort of like scholarly analytical sphere, that was really interesting. And that's the kind of thing that doesn't get extracted into headlines about who was convicted and who was given how many years in court, right? But a database like this that we could actually search for um, the way that people talk on the stand is really, really interesting. And then I will turn it over to Pam and, and stop talking in just a moment. But the one other thing is that I also provide expert testimony in um, asylum hearings for Honduran nationals. And I think having the ability to quickly and succinctly access 
the patterns of who in law enforcement in Honduras has been convicted of things in the United States and who in power, who in authority has been convicted of things in the United States is really, really helpful to show a pattern of um, neglect and the inability or the unwillingness of the Honduran state to protect people. Um, having that kind of data at my fingertips um, because I'm I'm doing a whole other thing in asylum cases that's not the same as the anthropological work, but having that kind of data to just be able to say like these many people who were the heads of police <laughs> of these police units have now been proven in a U.S. court to be corrupt um, is really helpful to show how why people cannot expect to be protected um, by the Honduran government in Honduras um, in a way that's very different from the academic work, but in asylum court that's really useful as well. Me toca. <laughs> um, okay, first and foremost, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm like, first and foremost, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but in criminal justice, we do read a lot of laws. Um, for, and secondly, congratulations. I think like the biggest contribution, right, that your project is going to have is just having all of this information publicly available. Like we say, yes, this is publicly available, but there is a fee to public availability. So like, that's a little questionable. Um, the fact that you will actually not only make this publicly available in English, but that you're taking the extra step and translating all of this material, like, my goodness gracious, like that is a huge contribution because that takes a lot of work, a lot of resources, a lot of time. Um, and court documents are not easy to read. They are not easy to digest. And I'm pretty sure they are much more difficult to translate um, and to make them just available to, you know, to Hondurans is, I mean, phenomenal. Um, in terms of the impacts, I think like I'd agree with Amelia, right? I think having these extraditions definitely proves what the rumors, right? Um, that, oh, you know, like politicians are involved or uh, people in certain uh, positions within, within the police department are involved. Um, the fact that you have testimonies within a court in the United States, you know, it brings a certain level of oh my gosh, all of these rumors are true, right? Or like, oh my goodness, like we really, like there starts to become, I think it now opens the gate to having very honest conversations about what is the level of involvement of the state, right? Um, if we look at the democracy literature, if we look at the literature in terms of organized crime, there is a certain sector within that literature that says that the state is not, a, the state can be a victim, right? But the state can also be an agent. And I think that in the case of Honduras, if there were, you know, with the release of all these documents that you are going to make public, I mean, my quantitative mind starts to think in like social network analysis, right? Like how are certain actors um, working together, where are they positioned and things like that um, in order to see what is the level of involvement on behalf of the state, right? Because it's one thing to turn a blind eye to like, a cargo of cocaine passing through a checkpoint, it is a very different thing to remove checkpoints or to, you know, as we heard in Tony Hernandez's case, to provide security for cocaine shipments through Honduras. Like those are very deliberate acts. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I think it really opens up this gate of what is the level of, it's no longer of like, is, the government involved, right? It is now a question of what is the level of involvement of the government and of certain positions. Um, I think that at, in, at an international level, I mean, you know, I know Jennifer has spoken about this, it opens the door, or at least it seems that the solution or what is hoped for is that a CC will come into Honduras and that it will resolve problems. And I think that if we look at the international bodies that have entered previously into Central America, right, if we take specifically the MASI, what the MASI was able to do, and the CC, I think that there are definitely entry points or something that can propel change. However, my questioning is always, but what is happening at the domestic level, right? Like you cannot have, inter you cannot rely on an international partner to resolve all of your problems. Um, I think that 
that in and of itself is an issue, right? Um, secondly, the international community only has a certain level of limits as to what it can actually do in a country. Like you actually need democratic institutions, democratic actors in order to make the system try to move the way that it should. Um, and so in that sense, I have like a wish list of like everything that could be done with all of the data you're about to release, right? Um, and that's primarily like is gonna take a lot more research in the sense of, um, you know, I would be very interested in seeing what key positions in the police departments um, were tapped into, right, um, in terms of location. So like, we know that the northern coast of Honduras is a key trafficking area, right? So that is a location. However, within that location, what police, uh, like ranks or what police positions were particularly tapped in order to facilitate the trafficking of that. And then maybe I'm just a little too ambitious, um, but I would also like to know what public policies are being put forth, not only um, domestically, you know, in Honduras within the national police force in terms of how will you prevent this corruption from happening again? What are the measures that you're going to put into place to ensure that this, you know, either rotating them, having them being vetted or having them consistently being vetted? Um, and then secondly, from a U.S. perspective, what is the U.S. or how will the U.S. help to ensure that these positions are also not going to be corrupted, right? Because we do know that there is a level of support on behalf of the United States for um, the PN, right? Uh, the National Police Force in Honduras. Um, and so, and then in terms of just qualitative data, I mean, just the things that you're going to have, right? Like when I heard Jennifer speak, I'm like, oh my God, the victims, like how many victims are we talking about? And like, what are the demographics? And how can that help in Amelia's asylum cases when she writes asylum cases, right? Like, do you have a certain demographic that is facing more levels of violence uh, because of the trafficking that is occurring? And, you know, can that facilitate an asylum case? Um, so I will stop there. But I think that those would certainly be I mean, I'm excited. <laughs> I just, I want to add, I just, I want to see the maps that Pam is going to make with this data. I don't make maps. I don't know how to make maps, but I want to see the map of where and at what rank the, yeah. the police officers who have been implicated in these trials, where they're located in Honduras. I also want to see the map of where the narcos who are implicated in these trials come from in Honduras. Like this is data that that is all sort of like swirling around that we all kind of know, but making it clear and visible and legible um, for someone like Pam who has those skills, which I sadly do not have, would just be so useful for all of us who are trying to make sense of what's happening um, in, in Honduras. Thank you. You know, I think also that this is very important for us because I think this, we all always thought this about collaboration because, well, journalists, we, we have our kind of research and you have your, your ideas. But for example, I was thinking then if we want to track victims or track the consequences in violence, if we could just mix databases from the homicide uh, databases of, of national police, for example, and the locations that we get from the court files, that would be amazing. But how we can do that? <laughs> what kind of expert we need <laughs> to mix those databases? And I think this is more about uh, Daniel and I and Contra Corriente asking for help. Like, hey, we, we have a lot of ideas of what to do with these documents, but also we need that they, uh, we want that they could be useful for different kind of investigation and give us like a whole view of all this narco state that is so famous and all, of, all the media is talking about, but I think they are not having this deep, deep, deep view of the context on, and the consequences on what's happening, what's really happening in Honduras. And also because these are networks that they are still working. So. I think it's very important to understand that we are not talking about the past time. We are talking about what's happening right now too. So, um, well, thank you a lot because I think this kind of collaborative and brainstorming ideas um, uh, are very useful and very important for us to give like, um, 
more uh, I, I, I focus on 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 this project. Can I say one more thing? I'm, so, I'm thinking of so many. You know, I think another thing that in the case of Honduras would be really useful to map out as it comes out in these trials is the relationship such that it exists in the way that it exists between gangs and narcos. Because we know in Honduras, that's not the same thing, but they get elided all the time by people who don't know Honduras particularly well, but maybe know other countries or um, just have a general sense of like all organized crime is the same. And I think one of the things that is very poorly understood is outside of Honduras is how these different organizations are different and they sometimes work together, sometimes don't have, it's, it's a very particular kind of landscape of multiple actors in multiple kinds of organized crime. And I think that the documents that come out of these trials could be one resource to help us really understand the articulation between power, narcos, bandas, and Maras, which is, uh, would be so useful. I'll add one thing and then maybe we'll turn it over for questions. But uh, Amelia, you made a great point about the limits and Pama, you touched on this as well, the limits of uh, extraditing and, 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 and juiciando, uh, putting on trial, I suppose, individuals. And I think, one way to chip away at that, those limits is exactly what you all are talking about right now, which is using the information that's sifted up through the courts to go deeper and to look systemically. Because in fact, for the folks that you were talking about, Amelia, the, the folks that you work with, um, for their lives to change, what's needed are systemic changes. And we, we can't see where rotting has happened and where, you know, fixing is needed until we do that sort of deep analysis. Um, perhaps, are, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? I think you can either put that put it into the chat box, or uh, if you're able to unmute yourselves, feel free. Could my cat and I ask a question? We would um, love that. <laughs> he likes to participate always in um, in Zooms. Um, my question is the relationship of this project to the attacks on independent journalism that are happening and coming fast and furious in Central America, including Honduras um, right now. How do you see this project, um, I don't know, in, intersecting with that uh, hostile landscape, or, or is it possible to push against it? Are you finding that your work may be interrupted in some way? Um, are you able to, I don't know, uh, could you talk about that, that intersection? Jen, Dali. Like the risks of this project or in Honduras? Or well, yeah, and, and also if you want to talk, people may not know what sorts of threats journalists face in Honduras, Honduran journalists especially, and um, yeah, how, like, would the structure of this project help get around some of those risks, or might it expose, you know? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we normalize a lot the violence here, <laughs> so sometimes sometimes this is the, the, the more, the, the most hard thing for me to speak because we are we have normalized violence against like general violence but uh yes Andres is one of the most dangerous countries to to be journalists because there's a lot of murderers since uh, I think 2000 we have more than 90 um journalists that have been murdered and uh, like 95 percent of the cases are in impunity so we don't know if the, these murders were about the job or not and that's also very very dangerous for the rest of the people because the rest of the journalists because uh what what so whatever that you're doing or not <laughs> the this country is dangerous <laughs> in general so if someone is going to um to kill you or to or to hit you they would do in a, a variety of, of ways and maybe you would not know why was this attack about 
Um, so this is like the context. Um, I think this project is also is more to protect us too, you know, because um, I think in collaboration, we have been protected a lot. I, I always say that Contra Corriente is alive because of collaboration with other media, with universities, with uh, academy people of uh, uh, different disciplines um, and all this help that we get into yes making this excel database you know uh, or um reading the the articles a lawyer that's reading the articles before we publish and this kind of um brainstorming too like hey maybe we can we we need to be to to be or to be reporting in this way and how to to get protected in this in this job, I think collaboration is like the clue here. And this is also like, not only to, to say, hey, we're the best journalists doing the best work and we're going to make these articles and this information is only mine because I pay for it. <laughs> it's more about, hey, we can have this, this, this information, but we also can talk about it and we also can discuss it and we also can have better results on investigation and research. So I think it protects us all um, uh, when, we, when we make this kind of projects. And I think Contra Corriente in all these five years we have um, been doing this job, this is like a very important thing for us. We need a community of, yes, of people, of people working interesting in interested in, in in things that we're reporting but also giving ideas and also protecting the work that, that we're doing so I think this project is also to protect us <laughs> it's not for putting us in written more risk is more to protect us because we we say hey this this information is public you know you you can have it and uh, we can work together to understand it so um, it's more about that than to uh, say we're going to write the best article ever. You know? we're, we're writing good articles, so go watch them, <laughs> go read them, but I think we can make a, a better work if we work uh, together with other disciplines and other people that are interested in, in the same things. And that have now that now will have these documents available too. Um, I've got a question here in the chat. Uh, the question is, well, there's a couple here. Is the administration or the US government supportive of the project? And if so, which entity? And also, as you're looking at the evidence, are you finding things that the U.S. government must have known about but turned a blind, blind eye towards? Uh, another one is, are you seeing and hearing that the administration of the U.S. government might get serious about reducing our implicit collaboration with bad people? All great questions. Um, would Jenny Ferd or Amelia or Pamela, would you like to speak to that at all? I can also speak a little bit. Okay, I'll go and then, or Jen, what were we gonna say? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so this is a good question about the administration. We, um, you know, journalistically we're in touch with administration officials when we're interviewing them, um, but otherwise not uh, in any, in touch with them. And so um, I think that, I mean, we, we can't say that, you know, if, if there's support or dissent or, or at all, but I think there is some interest in um, knowing more about what's going on. And so hopefully, you know, everybody, including administration officials would be served by having more access um, to these documents. Um, and uh, I think this is the, the question about, are we finding things that the US government must have known about but turned a blind eye towards? That has been pervasive from the very beginning of these trials that um, so much of what was going on was, um, it was systemic, it was um, 
shameless. Um, and there's just no way that the, that the US government didn't know. And um, I think an interesting, not necessarily an exception, but an interesting juxtaposition to that, that, we, that Jen and I found in looking into the case of the Rosenthal family, one of the business elite um, that was charged in the Southern District was that uh, proving money laundering is very, very difficult and finding evidence of it is very, very difficult, even for oversight agencies, even for the US federal government. And money laundering is a linchpin of without the money, none of this happens. That's the only reason a lot of these people are involved in this trade. And so it's uh, really a weakness of the international oversight system that has been exposed or you know, even more exposed because we all already know that um, by these trials. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have a good answer to, and I wonder if the three of you have an answer to whether you're seeing any signs from the Biden administration that there might be a different attitudes toward uh, Honduras, um, toward working with, you know, bad, bad actors. Um. I think part of what we see happening in these trials is that there are different and sometimes incoherent agendas within the U.S. government. So um, when Tony Hernandez was put on trial, that was because he came to the U.S. to go shopping and the DEA uh, arrested him. The United States federal, the federal government did not tried to get him extradited at the time under the Trump administration while um, being a really fierce ally of Juan Orlando. Um, I'm not sure Tony would have, and from what I understand, there was actually some uh, fighting going on between uh, people in state and the judiciary as he was being charged and the state department was not um, interested in going after him at that point. All of this is to say that I think the US foreign policy interests are really muddy and um, never a hundred percent good. Like I, I don't I don't think there there's a sort of like pure human rights agenda in the US foreign policy ever. Um, I think it varies in terms of like the Trump administration was rapidly anti-immigrant, right? Like they, their priority was stopping immigration and they cared about almost nothing else. Um, and so whatever Juan Orlando did was fine as long as he was playing ball with the immigration agenda. Um, I think the Biden administration is less singularly focused on that, but I don't think that means that the... Um, Biden administration or other democratic administrations is um, more likely to withhold support from bad actors, um, but it's part of a sort of a whole mosaic of foreign policy interests um, that that get that gets weighed in any given moment. Um, I think Juan Orlando Hernandez was no longer it was too, was too egregious and no longer that useful, especially when he was no longer president. Um, but I, I don't know that it necessarily signals like a really different uh, kind of weighing of priorities in terms of our foreign policy. I think maybe um, what I would add is, I mean, did the US turn a blind eye? I think history tells us that the US tends to turn a blind eye. Um, in certain things, right? Um, whether it's because they believe it's right or not, or because it's just going to be a diplomatic mess, I think is where a lot of the complexity <laughs> starts to come in. Um, I think you do see this administration try to tackle, I mean, in comparison to other administrations, it seems like higher up officials are, have publicly spoken out. Um, I think when you look at the US strategy for, you know, countering corruption, I've never seen something to that extent coming out uh, from an from an administration, right? You also had the, what is it, the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission speak and actually question whether the drug on the war on drugs is an efficient, you know, war. Um, taking into consideration all of the counterproductive 
issues it has caused within you know transit countries as well as producing countries um while those things are being publicly said and that you know this very macro level i think a, the more applied version of me would like to see how is this going to play out on the ground right like how are you going to use the information that is coming out of these uh, coming out of these court cases and actually apply them to the vetting of police officers or to the level of cooperation that the United States has with the police department and or even with the military in the case of Honduras where the military is being used for you know um police responsibilities um and then I think even there we're still falling short right um when you look at Xiomara Castro uh President Castro during her her speech did say that you know, she was going to move from um, militarized, you know, security force into a more civilian police force. While there are, you know, it's been stated that the police will now have a community policing, which I still want somebody to describe what they mean by that, because community policing can mean so many things. And I have yet somebody to describe like exactly which form of pol community policing they're going to do. Um, she's still giving a great level of the budget to the military. And so at a domestic level, I don't see a change. I don't see that change, even though the United States is making very public statements of like, hey, we're going after corruption. What we want is democracy. I think at a more applied level, I have not seen funding stop. I have not seen funding switch. I have not seen additional training or vetting or, and so, I think that that would have been the expectation of all of this information coming to light, right? Like, how do you actually reform the police department, a department that is responsible to serve and protect its citizens, a department that has shown that it has not done that, right? Like, what are you, like, what are the lessons learned? What are the lessons learned and how are they going to be applied? And not only at a domestic level within Honduras, but also what are the lessons for the United States and how should it not continue to repeat the same mistakes? I just want to add that um, I think it's very important to understand also that corrupt actors are not only politicians and are not only police, police, national police or military, they are also elites, economic elites. And I think in that way, um, there is, it is more difficult for the US uh, to not to work with the, these elites because history has told us that that's not going to happen. And for example, I think the US has this angle list, uh, the sanctions that um, at first we thought, hey, that's very interesting, this kind of, of sanctions against uh, uh, corrupt actors. But in Honduras, um, they have been pointing a lot of politicians that are uh, prosecuted in the US because of these narco uh, narcos cases but we have not seen any um, sanctions for um, elites. And uh, it, it's interesting because in, I think in El Salvador and in Guatemala and in Nicaragua, I think the last, the last angle list pointed businessmen. And that was very interesting. And why in Nicaragua, but not in Honduras, um, why these all these difficulties around uh, proving money laundering because there are members of the elite, not only political elite, but also economic elite involved in this kind of, uh, this kind of crimes. Also corruption, corruption is also um, something that not only politicians do or not only politicians get um, get rich because of, of corruption. Also, economic elites are involved. And I think um, there's like a big doubt uh, from the US strategy against corruption or corrupt actors that um, we need to, to see more uh, around other kind of actors. And I know this is a very difficult thing to speak, um, yes, just a few days before um, the, the, um, the ambassador, the US ambassador in Honduras was having a meeting with a family that had been pointed um, from, from human rights violations, for example, 
and I, I think uh, there's a lot of doubt on how we, how the U.S. is approaching economic elites in this in these countries. Um, I think that's um, that's one one thing I wanted to add because also in the U.S. Uh, in these court documents, we've seen a lot of that <laughs> on how are treated. Uh, by the this justice system that in Honduras we've seen that is a very very good justice system like in comparison to Honduras justice system uh, but it's not equal for all and and I think it's also um, a thing that that we could analyze more and how is not this justice system not perfect you know <laughs> Uh, trying to understand this justice system, but trying to understand these inequalities and these um, different approaches around corrupt actors, of different corrupt actors in in our societies. Any last questions? Hey, I have a question, or maybe a couple questions. <laughs> Um, I, I first, my name is Carissa. I'm actually a friend of Danielle's and ran into her yesterday and she told me about this project and I was super excited. Um, I think what you all are doing is really important and um, will, you know, go down in history and part of like the project of trying to build democracy in Central America. So um, I, yeah, I really love this project. Um, I am a student right now actually at uh, John Jay in the Masters of Economics program. And um, we have, it's a kind of heterodox program. So, you know, students who are very um, progressive and uh, they're driven, they're, they're driven by a concern about social justice. Um, and I think they'd be super fascinated to put their kind of data analysis skills um, to work on a project like this. Um, so I was, if you guys have any interest in, I think it would be a great project actually for um, John Jay, like multiple departments within John Jay to collaborate on. Um, and if you guys are interested in doing like a presentation at John Jay, I could, um, I would be happy to facilitate something like that. Um, I was wondering though, uh, just a point of clarification, because it, it looks like you guys have already extract, extracted um, tons of information from the court documents. Um, and so I, it wasn't clear to me if you guys, uh, if the need is more so figuring out what to do with that data and how to make it kind of visually um, uh, accessible and uh, yeah, like just accessible in general to the public um, and creating visuals or something out of that? Or are you guys still needing help with like extracting all of that data from the court documents? Uh, in, in this last part, we have only extracted one case. Um, we have downloaded 60% of the documents of 12 cases, but we only have extracted and translated one case, which is United States versus Lobo. Um, but now we need to, uh, to decide where to put it, like in the cloud and how to visualize it, or if we're only going to put all those documents to get to download it, for the people to download it. We want to be visually um, friendly. <laughs> so we're uh, trying, Right now, we're we're working with the tech experts, trying to decide what to do in which cloud and in which system you can you could um, visualize, download, extract, and translate um, um, one document one document at a time. So, um, but yes, that's. That's like a challenge right now, where to put this and how to make it friendly to download and, and to visualize all these documents. But for now, we only have one case um, extracted and download and um, translated. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, Carissa. It looks like George has a question and then Jorge. 
Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for this. I'm really sad I came in late. I got confused with the time zones. Um, so I'm George Raglan. I work for Trocra um, here in Honduras. I'm based in Tegucigalpa. Really fascinated to hear about what you're doing. Um, and as Jennifer, as you were talking about money laundering and the involvement of elites, um, I was kind of formulating questions in my head. Um, and what you said makes absolute sense. You know, nobody, um, for example, we've seen how not just the involvement of uh, money laundering in banks like HSBC, who were forced to withdraw from, from, the, from Central America and Mexico, um, um, and obviously Continental, I personally believe was touched because it was a small bank and it wasn't gonna sort of jeopardize the, the, the Honduran financial system, but we know it's not the only Honduran bank or banking group um, exposed and vulnerable to money laundering. And we've also seen how groups like FICOSA have moved offshore. You know, now they have, they're, they're set up out of Panama. They're protected by all those secrecy laws. And so that I guess that after listening to you, the question that I was just running around my head was, is this ever even discussed in Washington? I mean, not just for you, I mean, for all of you, you know, is this even a topic of conversation? Given that, as you said, Danielle, you know, the drugs war is driven by money. And if you can't launder the money, there's no drugs war. Well, there's no drugs trafficking. Um, so I was just wondering really whether this is ever discussed um, in the State Department, in Congress, um, or whether the DOJ has ever seriously thought about looking into what's happening or going through offshore havens like Panama or the Caymans or the Bahamas. So um, yeah, just, um, but thank you very much for, for this space. It's really, really interesting. Jen, do you want to say anything about that? I can speak to uh, I don't know. I don't know about Washington's uh, interest in, uh, in that. But uh, in my point of view, I think um, the US also have like priorities around um, the crimes that they are going to get deep in. For example, um, it's more important for the US to investigate uh, money laundering or um, or trafficking of weapons if there is a terrorism crime uh, than drug trafficking. I think it's like, um, and I, I think Daniel, that some some source told us something like that, like uh, we put our energy in terrorism um, cases more than in this kind of drug trafficking or corruption or this kind of money laundering because it's too difficult, but it's also not related to terrorism. So I think it's um, kind of the, the the priorities that the the U.S. government are are putting into into the into the justice system. Um, but I don't know. I am not certain of of, of why. But maybe Danielle. <laughs> yeah, I can. What I thought of as you were asking your question, George, and I'm so glad you asked it. Thank you. Um, is the times that we see an interest in Washington to, to do something about this um, is when there are major drops like from ICIJ, the, the types of cross-border transnational journalistic organizations that get uh, a leak, a massive leak that shows how the system subverts rules, whether it's you know, taxes or or um, just offshore, the offshore industry in general, um, or laundering. And um, the, the attempts are always to try to like, tighten a bit more the capacity for oversight, um, or for, uh, you know, any sort of consequences that, that companies would have to face and individuals could face. But there's, there, there doesn't seem to be um, political will or, or a, a a really um, effective solution that's in the ecosystem right now. Um, and that's all the more concerning. And I guess this does kind of connect to the earlier question about the Biden administration, because uh, we did see Kamala Harris come down to Central America and speak about the administration's intent to invest, to do private investment, to invest through, through private industry. Um, and I, I think from one argument, that they may they may make for that strategy is that they're trying to avoid putting money into 
government systems that have been shown to be incredibly corrupt. And, you know, that's not only true in Honduras, it's also definitely true in El Salvador uh, and Guate and, and Nicaragua. Um, but the, I think there's this imagined ideal of how private enterprise in these countries works. Um, and there, you know, there, there's no, uh, there's kind of a blindness uh, at this point. It's a, it's a willing blindness to see the way that private enterprise has been involved in not only acts of corruption and financial crime, but also violence, you know, paying for violence, um, perpetrating violence. Um, and the, the, um, legal system um, and the oversight system that would be needed to be able to keep these private actors in check uh, doesn't exist. And so um, it really, you know, it's it's not a solution to come and invest a bunch of money into um, the, the, the economic elite um, of, of Central America. Um, and it, it ultimately bolsters the network that then is participating in what your, your question is about, George, with, um, yeah. Silvio has a question. Ah, uh, Pamela, sorry, did you want to say something? I mean, yeah, just real quickly. I think Danny hit the nail on the head. Like, money laundering is very difficult to investigate, right? <laughs> very, very difficult, especially when you start to see the dynamics in Panama and how everything is being kind of like offshored into Panama. Um, I'm not sure, but I want, I do want to say that like, there seems to be this awakening, right? That like, you do have to start attacking money laundering. And I think there it's like, jurisdictionally, right? Like, I think that's where the caveat falls. Like, the United States will probably not be able to investigate something in Central America because that's kind of like beyond their jurisdiction. However, if money from Central America is being moved within the United States, right, and being deposited, then I think that that opens like gateways into, okay, now we can investigate these things. Um, I think one of the biggest cases that I'm aware of is the one in um, Mexico and what is it, the HSBC bank, right? Like a couple of years ago, and, but again, big bank, big, like you're talking very huge um, amounts of money. And so what Jennifer is saying is true, right? Like there's only a limited amount of resources and just like people and money laundering is also difficult to just investigate. And so you kind of have to, I feel like you have to choose very wisely which cases you're going to attack, but definitely something where I think like more light needs to be shed on it and the importance of, hey, money, huge amounts of money are behind this. And if you can tap into that, you're really going to hit, may potentially like identifying that as one of the root causes of the problem. Okay, Silvio. Hi, it's good to see you, Daniela. Uh, Jennifer, good to see you too. I'm glad, I'm so happy you guys are uh, doing this and you're making inroads into the US. I'm sure, I know you've been doing that for a while and please continue to work. Um, this is the stuff we so badly need as you and I both know, Danielle. Um, and um, I just wanted to say, please keep it up. Uh, but also um, I think what's, what's been concerning to me recently is, as far as the US is that nothing seems to have changed even, you know, uh, six, seven years after Berta's assassination. Um, we thought that could bring about change, but it still didn't happen. So um, I think we've got a good base. I think you've started to develop a great, a, a good base for the, those of us here in the US to, to make people aware of what is happening, really happening in Honduras and not, you know, the ambassador's tweets and the US embassy's tweets about how great things are going. Um, I think there's a lot of manipulation happening by the US government currently, and um, we need to combat that with the information you're going to bring about. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that I do have some FOIAs that um, you and I can talk about separately um, that maybe would help with your project. Thank you so much.
Ah, Jorge. Sure. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for all of this. Um, it's actually super helpful because I'm right now in college and I was doing, I'm doing like a research about the Trump administration and how they, their contradictions in foreign policy in, in Honduras and that database would be like great. But in terms of um, the average Honduran, how would you guys, I don't know, envision to synthesize this data for them to like analyze, for, for them to like see and understand it? Because these are like members of the community, like the national police officer, people who they know, they hear in their national news. And like this information is very like widespread in, the, in independent journalism, but like in tele, like in national television and like spaces like that, we don't hear about like all these networks as much. So how do you guys, I don't know, what's the conversation that we can start in terms of this database and informing the average citizen of Honduras? Yes, I think it's very difficult because all, all the stories that are very catchy uh, for the media are more about narco culture or uh, how big was Juan Orlando's house because of the money of the narcos. <laughs> That's very difficult to, to, um, to put this kind of information like in mainstream media or in the social media, which are the the, the things that people used to get informed. <laughs> but I think that's a, a challenge for journalists. I think not only Contra Corriente, but also a lot of journalists could have access to this, to this document now. We will have access to this document uh, when we publish them. And I think we need to start to uh, work together or collaborate to, to translate like not to Spanish, but translate to uh, more simple language or um, a different language for people to understand, but also to get deep into the into the issue, you know, because I can say, well, I will translate and I will get only the most uh, irrelevant information in the cases, but maybe that could be more catchy for people. I think that we need to, uh, try to get deep into the documents, uh, investigate more, but uh, maybe collaborate to get all this information into regular people watching TikTok or watching TV or listening to the radio. But I think that's a um, very difficult job in, in Honduras, um, especially because of the, of the agenda of mainstream and also um, everything happening here <laughs> uh, but um, yes I think it's, it's a very important thing to to discuss and how to get this information into the mainstream and uh, into the media that people is watching and um, watching every day um, yes Okay, maybe we'll go ahead and end it there then. Um, thank you all so much for uh, coming to listen and to share your ideas for your great questions. Um, thank you, our esteemed panelists, uh, Pame and Amelia, for all of your input and your brilliance, as always. Um, and to the Center for Mexico and Central America and NARDA, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we've really, really been grateful for what we've been able to do with, with your support. So. Thank you, and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much, everyone. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Thank you. And a reminder that this event has been recorded and will be posted shortly for those of you who missed parts of it. Thank you. <laughs>